Privilege and Shame, a Personal and Existential Perspective. In this video, I'd like to explore the dynamics of privilege and shame, mostly from the perspective of my own observations and experience, but partially from an existential perspective too. Part of the reason why I want to do this is first that the constructs of privilege and shame are currently gaining increasing traction within popular culture, but also because I have some thoughts about these issues, and so I hope to shed some light on them. Anyhow, I'd like to proceed first by exploring shaming and its dubious relation to growth and transcendence, and then by applying that analysis to the currently popular discursive practices that center around privilege. But let's look at shaming first. By now, it's probably obvious that shaming is occupying a fairly prominent place within popular discourse. Some common examples in today's world would be fat shaming, slut shaming, food shaming, and body shaming. But for the sake of simplicity, I'll use fat shaming and slut shaming as my primary examples, mostly because they seem to be the types that appear most commonly in everyday talk. So, the question is, what's going on with all this shaming? Well, it seems to me that shaming is about trying to get others to behave in a certain way, whether it's in the form of losing weight or being less promiscuous, especially by getting people to experience some form of negative self-judgment or self-appraisal. In other words, shaming is really about attempting to control other people's behaviors by manipulating their emotions and especially by manipulating their sense of self-worth. In this regard, shaming is basically about trying to control other people, and consequently about trying to exercise power over them. It's about trying to get others to think, feel, and behave according to our own sense of what is, quote, appropriate. But, of course, people rarely take kindly to being manipulated and controlled, which is, I suspect, what has given birth to the proliferation of terms like fat shaming and slut shaming. I sense that people who have been shamed use these kinds of terms mostly to reverse the dynamic of shaming, essentially by shaming the shamers, by getting them to feel bad about their manipulative behavior. So, I find that for the most part, the underlying dynamics of shame have mostly to do with control and power, and then counter-resistance to control and power. One existential thinker who sheds further light on emotions such as shaming is Jean-Paul Sartre, especially in an early work entitled The Emotions, Outline of a Theory. Here, Sartre contends that one of the principal functions of emotions in our lives is to further what he calls bad faith. Briefly, bad faith is a way of denying the deeper reality of our existential condition, which is to say, the reality of our being factically free and responsible agents. From this perspective, there's really no such thing as shaming, because no one ever forces us to feel shame without our implicit consent, which is itself a kind of choice we may or may not make. In other words, we typically like to think that other people have the power to shame us, but that's mostly because we're trying to hide from ourselves the terrible reality that we're actually free and responsible for the quality of our emotional lives. So, contrary to popular wisdom, no one ever triggers us because, well, we're not like guns. Inanimate objects like guns don't decide how and when they go off, but we do. And we like to think we're being triggered by shame or anything else, mostly because we're trying to hide from that. In that regard, the entire edifice of shaming, like so many other social trends and conventions, is really nothing more than a kind of bad faith theater we're performing for each other. It is, essentially, a theater of excuses. But, of course, there's a lot more to a complex social phenomenon like shaming than that. Usually, there's a set of justifications that goes along with it. Probably the most common one in shaming is altruistic, and it goes like this. Well, it's for their own good. After all, it's simply not healthy to be overweight or to engage in promiscuity. Another fairly common justification is somewhat more selfish. In addition, I don't want to have to pay for someone else's unhealthy, irresponsible life choices in the form of higher health care costs that will ultimately be translated to increases in my bill. And yeah, at a certain level of descriptions, these seem like pretty convincing justifications for things like fat shaming and slut shaming. However, the problem with shaming doesn't lie at the level of its justifications – 
The problem has to do with whether shaming is really a good, reliable way of helping people change for the better. My own sense is that we only rarely change in any deep, positive way because we're being shamed into doing so. Of course, there are cultures in the world where this isn't necessarily true, places where shaming is much more culturally prominent. Cultural anthropologists sometimes call these shame societies. However, with respect to the culture of the United States, where I live, I find that people's most common reaction to being shamed is resentment and resistance. Here in the United States, most of us just don't like being told what we ought to be doing or how we ought to be thinking of ourselves. And so, our most immediate reaction to shaming is probably, well, screw you. Most likely because we're sensing the element of emotional manipulation and control in shaming. In this regard, the most common effect of shaming is probably to produce even more of the behaviors that are being shamed, mostly because of our natural resentment and defiance. For instance, the most common effect of fat shaming is probably to encourage overweight people to flaunt their bodies even more, not less. Hence, we start to see things like the emergence of plus-size models, as well as the so-called fat acceptance movement. Their attempts to respond to fat shaming by defiantly moving in the exact opposite direction. But, of course, sometimes shaming really does succeed in wounding us and making us feel bad about ourselves. In that case, I find that our most common reaction to shaming is repression. When we're ashamed, one of the common things we do is try to hide what we're ashamed of from others, as well as from ourselves, and act like everything's okay. But, of course, this doesn't make the thing we're ashamed of go away. It simply buries it more deeply within us, where, as psychoanalytic thinkers have observed, it can then exert an even more insidious and toxic influence over us. In this regard, shaming doesn't teach us to be healthier, only sneakier and more neurotic and more thoroughly ruled by what we're trying to repress. And then, finally, there are comparatively rare cases where shaming really does help us change in a healthy, positive way. But these seem exceedingly uncommon, at least to me. In fact, I'd estimate that they constitute maybe one case in 20, or even less. So... All in all, I find that shaming is a pretty good way of generating resentful, defiant, and neurotic people, but a very poor and unreliable way of getting people to change in genuinely positive, healthy ways. Incidentally, this is also why shaming is hardly ever employed as a treatment in psychotherapeutic contexts. It's because it's not very conducive to positive change in people's lives. All right. At this point, I'd like to turn toward exploring some of the currently popular rhetoric about privilege. As an entry point into this, let's look at the now ubiquitous exhortation for us all to check your privilege. So, the first question would be, what is really being asked of us here? In my view, it basically boils down to four things. At the most obvious surface level, we're being asked to recognize the various ways that power and advantage have been allotted to us, simply by dint of our having been born of a certain race or gender or socioeconomic class or sexual orientation, etc. And yes, this side of privilege seems to be one of the incontestable realities of life. Some of us are automatically allocated more advantage than others of us are. And it seems to be a pattern that occurs in many different guises across pretty much every culture and every historical epoch. At the physical level, some of us are simply born stronger and others weaker, some taller and others shorter, some smarter and others not so smart. At the more social level, some of us are born into more favored races or castes or genders or social classes, and some of us aren't. So at one level, when we're being asked to check your privilege, we're being asked to recognize something fairly obvious, the fact that we've been favored by life in various ways, some more than others. However, at a second, somewhat deeper level, it seems to me that we're also being asked to recognize that those advantages aren't fair. After all, I didn't really do anything special to enjoy the advantages allotted to Caucasian cis males in my culture. True, my ancestors may have labored long and hard to generate those advantages, and may have also oppressed others along the way, but those historical antecedents aren't specifically my doing. Basically, 
I get to enjoy those advantages because of the plain dumb luck of being born in a particular way at a particular point in time. So, at this second level, I sense that we're being asked to recognize that the advantages we enjoy are born out of luck, rather than merit, and consequently, aren't fair. And here, maybe it'd be good to take a brief detour to explore how we tend to view the relationship between luck and fairness, because it seems to have a lot to do with our perceptions of privilege. So, the question is, is it fair for some people to be blessed by good fortune, basically for no good reason, while other people aren't? For instance, is it fair for some people to win the lottery, while others have to labor all day long for their entire lives? I think that the answer is, no, it's not particularly fair, but that's how life is. In other words, life doesn't actually provide any reliable affirmation of our ideals of fairness or justice. Life's logic is that sometimes we get what we deserve, and sometimes we don't. And moreover, a lot of the time, bad things end up happening to good people, and bad people end up getting away with their misdeeds. So, no, our lucky privileges don't seem particularly fair, but that's ultimately because, drumroll please, life isn't fair. And it's probably not terribly reasonable to think it should be either. Mostly because... Well, it obviously isn't. In this regard, the attempt to make fairness or justice the main focal point of everything is actually an attempt to make life into something that's not. To superimpose onto life a series of desires and an agenda that are at odds with life's reality, which is pretty much a futile endeavor because, well, the deeper reality is that life will be what it is, whether we like it or not. We're playing life's game. Life isn't playing ours. This relationship between how we perceive luck and how we perceive fairness is also where the rhetoric about checking your privilege intersects with the project of social justice, whose warriors are currently seeking to rebalance the scales of social inequity across many dimensions of our lives. Of course, the main problem with the social justice movement is that there are naturally many diverse and divergent views about what justice actually is and how it works. So the question then naturally becomes, exactly whose vision of justice is the one that's supposed to be the, quote, appropriate one for everyone else's lives and values? Is it the Tea Party's vision of justice, or Vladimir Putin's, or that espoused by an elitist coterie of like-minded liberal academicians? Or maybe the one associated with Christian or Islamic fundamentalism? My own sense is that the answer, as it issues from the social justice movement, is basically... Well, it's our particular vision of justice because we possess the correct one that should naturally be imposed on everyone else. But the fact of the matter is that the social justice movement's vision of justice is but one of a wide diversity of opinions and perceptions about the nature of justice, and not what it's often advertised as, namely, the self-evidently correct model of justice that should be automatically mandatory for everyone else. So, the essential problem with the social justice movement, at least as I see it, is that in one way or another, it's just a way of foisting the viewpoint of one clique of self-appointed moral guardians onto the rest of the world, ironically, with little regard for the world's diversity of perspectives with respect to the question of what justice is and how it should be meted out. But, let's get back to privilege. As we saw before our little detour into luck, fairness, and social justice, when we're being asked or ordered to check your privilege, we're essentially being asked to recognize our advantages, and then to recognize that we've gained them unfairly, mostly by being lucky enough to be born into the right race, the right gender, the right social class, etc. In my view, the third thing we're being asked is to feel a sense of shame and or guilt about our good fortune, especially insofar as it's not particularly fair that we're enjoying it while other people aren't. Personally, I don't think that what the Check Your Privilege crowd wants is for us to recognize our advantages so that we can celebrate them, feel glad and proud to possess them, and then add new privileges to the ones we already have. They don't want that. They don't want us to have a positive emotional relation to our privileges. What they really want, even though it usually remains unspoken, is for us to feel lousy and ashamed of ourselves for possessing our privileges. 
In other words, I find that the rhetoric of check your privilege is actually not very different from any other form of shaming. It basically amounts to a type of privilege shaming and isn't very different in principle from fat shaming, slut shaming, or any other type. And like other forms of shaming, check your privilege is really about trying to exert control over other people by manipulating their sense of shame and self-perception. And finally, I guess for the sake of completeness, let's mention the fourth thing I think the check your privilege mavens would like, which would be for us to ultimately give up at least some fraction of our privileges so that others can enjoy them instead, thereby rebalancing the scales of their vision of fairness and justice. In other words, at this fourth level, the rhetoric of checking your privilege aims at getting us to act against our own self-interest and to put ourselves in the service of other people's agendas and self-interest instead. All in all, I find that the ultimate goal of all this is actually a reasonably laudable one, namely to help the world change into a fairer, more equitable, and hospitable place to live. However, the problem with employing a shame-driven strategy to attain all this is... Well, pretty much the same problem that occurs when we use shaming tactics to get people to change at the individual level. It basically boils down to the fact that shaming people isn't actually a good way of helping us grow beyond our existing limitations and pathologies. In fact, as we saw earlier, a lot of the time trying to get people to change via shame produces the exact opposite of its intended effect, especially insofar as people tend to react to it with defiance and resentment. When you fat shame people too much, a lot of the time they'll defiantly flaunt their bodies even more, not less. Similarly, when you try too hard to get people to feel ashamed of their politically incorrect utterances and attitudes, a lot of the time they'll respond by becoming even more offensive and inappropriate. For instance, when you try to shame people into saying only nice, inoffensive, appropriate things for a couple of decades, what you'll eventually get in the political sphere is something like the meteoric rise of Donald Trump, which is so mystifying to so many people these days. But actually, Trump's political success is easily comprehensible. It's because he gives voice to a lot of the ugly, inappropriate things most of us have shamefully repressed, but which still live and breathe within us. And people flock to him by the millions, despite his crassness, his unbridled vanity, and his staggering puerility, because he possesses one singular quality that, well, out-trumps all the rest. He's one of the very few souls left in the public sphere who hasn't been subdued by shame and self-censorship, and that's the main thing that draws his admirers to him. In other words, the political correctness movement has ironically itself given birth to Donald Trump the politician, and he'd be nothing without it. He is, as Freud once famously put it, the return of the repressed. Brash, unapologetically reveling in the immensity of his privilege and power, taking what he desires without regret, he is the caricature of a Nietzschean master morality in an era dominated by slaves and disingenuous displays of slavish sanctimony, which also explains why he's the target of so much resentment, acrimony, and thinly veiled envy. However, what remains to be seen is what he would really contribute to the world if he were to succeed in his bid for the presidency, which I don't think he will. I think that Hillary Clinton will defeat him handily in November. And in my view, this is what the issue of privilege is really about. As you've probably already inferred, my own view is that privilege, and even unfair privilege, is simply an inevitable aspect of human existence, especially given where the human race is at present in its evolutionary path. And I obviously feel that little is to be gained by inducing people to be ashamed of the privileges they possess. But that still leaves open the whole question of the best uses of privilege. My sense is that John Kennedy crystallized it pretty well when he said, Of those to whom much is given, much is required. Uh, I think that was more like Arnold Schwarzenegger. Anyhow, in other words, the question is not whether we're privileged or not. The question is what we're doing with our privileges. And yes, it's important for us to take genuine joy in our privileges and advantages and not be paralyzed by some sort of neurotic sense of shame about them.
but it's equally important to use those privileges as an occasion to contribute something worthwhile to the world. So I say, if you were lucky enough to be born powerful in this world, then be powerful, without shame and without regret. But be powerful beautifully, and remember that the deepest, most beautiful expressions of power are those that give birth to something, that create something magnificent, not only for ourselves, but for all of life and for the universe as a whole. So, at this point, let me conclude by anticipating a counter-argument that will likely appear in the comments section of this video, and it goes something like this. Will, methodically deconstructing the current rhetoric about privilege sounds like the typical defensive reaction on the part of someone who's already privileged. And guess what, Mr. Video Maker? You happen to be a well-educated, middle-aged, white, American, cis male. So, if your own reaction to this video sounds more or less like that, then here's my response to you. Yes, I fully acknowledge that I am privileged in many ways in this life. However, you're actually affirming one of the main points in this video, which is that activism that engages in shaming people is unlikely to change people for the better and is most likely to generate a lot of defiant resistance to itself, especially from those it wants to shame the most. In this case, white American cis males. And the same goes for all of the strident, quote, outrage, too. For the most part, your approach isn't generating friends and allies, and it isn't building connections. Instead, it's generating hardened opponents and enemies, and is consequently dividing us even more, which is the source of a lot of the world's problems in the first place, isn't it? Beyond this, however, personally, I simply refuse to feel bad about where fate has cast me. Instead, I feel grateful for my privileges. And as an expression of my gratitude, I actively try to use my advantages to make the deepest possible contributions to the world, to make my contributions and the meaning of my life worthy of the privileges I've unfairly received. That's true in my career, in my family life, as well as in taking the time and energy to make these videos. And to be frank, it seems highly improbable to me that anyone else could do much better with the privileges I currently possess. So no, I'm not particularly inclined to give them away to someone else. Sorry. Have a nice day.